Dr. Russell Richardson is the founder and director of the Utah Vascular Research Laboratory, for which the major mission is to elucidate the impact of age and age-related disease on skeletal muscle, vascular, and metabolic control function, with a strong emphasis on the implications for physical function and mobility. He is the Marjorie Rosenblatt Goodman and Jack Goodman Family Professor of Geriatrics in the University of Utah School of Medicine and Professor in the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology as well as an adjunct professor in the Department of Physical Therapy in the College of Health. Additionally, he is the Associate Director for the VA Salt Lake City Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center. Dr. Richardson has worked on a wide variety of integrative physiologic studies focused upon limitations to exercise in health and disease for over 25 years. We're really fortunate to have Dr. Richardson with us here this morning. I look forward to his talk, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Richardson. I should have uh, done more so that you could introduce me for longer, so I could get the uh, microphone work. But I don't think it's working. Does it sound like it's working? Oh, it's working now. Okay. I tend to have a pretty loud voice. <coughs> anyway, so thanks very much for being invited to this uh, conference. It's certainly uh, uh, a pleasure to be here, and I, the theme is very nice. I like the link. I wish I'd heard that talk uh, probably 20 years ago because I'm. We get up early and run, probably bad for my back. But being talking and twisting things for a long time, so I have a uh, back issue. So that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, and I show this picture, and I tend to be somebody who likes to point at the slide. So you will uh, hopefully you will. I think my point is working. So they usually don't work on the screens. Yeah, let's see. It seems like the screens are taking over. Um, so, um, I also show you this picture because coming from Salt Lake City down to Provo, I can't help but think about the old joke that used to be between Edinburgh and Glasgow, which is uh, Edinburgh would always say that one thing that Glasgow has that Edinburgh doesn't have is a internationally known metropolitan city just 45 minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Salt Lake, here's the University of Utah, a couple of good plugs for people who want to come up. So you have a recent, actually it's probably not so recent, but uh, is it two years ago now? Almost two years ago we uh, donated one of our trainees back to you who came up, Jason Gifford, who is now uh, assistant professor in uh, exercise science. And so uh, if people are interested in coming up to the U, you certainly can get some good experiences. And if you're not careful, you'll end up back here. <laughs> so I have a very long and intricate title, and when I, I, don't, I don't usually do long titles, but for some reason I wanted to kind of encompass everything, just in case I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to talk about probably. <laughs> so I said, is it aging or inactivity that increases our risk of cardiovascular disease and decreases our exercise capacity as we get older? And when I put this together a little bit more, I realized that what I might be talking about is, is exercise the fountain of youth? And as we get older, can we still drink from that fountain? So this is an illustration of the sort of initial thoughts that this was a fountain you could go drink from and you would stay youthful. Well, I think that exercise is probably one of the major components or a very useful part of the, or a component of the fountain of youth. So if you remember that as we go through this, I'm talking about whether exercise is going to keep us healthier longer, and also if we, as we are getting older and aging, whether aging people can still access the fountain of youth, and whether there are some big changes that make it not really as beneficial for an older person in terms of uh, exercise uh, <laughs> benefits. So as a consequence, uh, I'm going to, as an outline, I'm going to talk a little bit, give you an introduction, sort of background of why I'm thinking along these lines. And then I'm going to give you three examples of the link between aging, physical activity, and things that we have studied in the past. So our group is quite diverse in its interests, and I will show you three different areas that we have studied in the last few years, 
that should give you some insight into the link between aging and exercise and the plasticity associated with older people. So those are vascular health, muscle aging, and limitations to exercise. And at the end, it will be a very simple take-home message, which I probably have already sort of indicated, that exercise is definitely good for you. The question is, can people still benefit from that exercise uh, regimes when they are whole? So when you look at this, um, this image, you can see that 400 years ago, you'd be lucky to live till 30 years old. So we've had a huge increase in life expectancy, and as you can imagine, something that goes along with that is a need for, um, you're coming in with the really powerful laser point? Works on the walls, slides. So as you can see from this slide, there is obviously a large increase in the life expectancy, and now we're up at around 82 years in the US on average, and that means that there is obviously a much stronger interest and a much greater need for understanding the effects of aging because we have a population that is at, uh, definitely becoming older and older and uh, advances have made that, uh, advances in medicine and um, science have made that possible. So one interesting thing is I forgot to mention is that I also work as well, the universe, as well as at the University of Utah, also at the the GREC, the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center in the VA. And uh, in the 70s, the VA, which often gets a bad name, you see all these different stories about the VA and how they're not keeping up with uh, certain regulations that it should be. It's interesting that one of the many things that the VA did is they had a lot of forethought to the fact that there are going to be a lot more older people in the future. And it turns out the VA system has about uh, it's about 65 years ahead of the normal population in terms of the aging situation. So if you look at the population of the VA, 65 years from now, our population will be about that same uh, demographic, the same distribution. So the VA is a very interesting place to, to do research in older people because there are a lot of older people in the veteran system. Another thing that happens as we get older is that you become more and more likely to experience or, or uh, have an episode related to cardiovascular disease. And you can see this as you move through the different age groups. By the time you get up into your 80s, about 80% of the people who are in their 80s have significant cardiovascular disease. Contrast that with people in their 20s. So is this a consequence of aging? Or is it a consequence of diminished exercise or less drinking from the fountain of youth, if you think exercise is the fountain of youth? Well, it turns out that this person, if you look on the internet, you'll find her all over the place. And at first when I saw her, this is uh, Johanna Kwas. I remember thinking, that is Photoshop. There is no way that that is real. But it turns out she is, I think, at least 92 or 93 now, still competing in gymnastics, and certainly goes well with the quote from this, it's actually an English author, uh, Adwell, uh, Edward uh, bulwer Lytton. It is not the gray hair, it is not by the gray of the hair that one knows the age of the heart, because she's certainly got gray hair, but she is in extremely good condition. And if you ever get a chance, you should look her up and watch some of the videos of her competing in gymnastics meets. She's actually quite impressive. So. Another thing that is a social we need to think about in terms of this uh, topic is overall metabolic capacity or aerobic capacity, the ability to exercise, is related to your uh, chance of survival. So it turns out that if you look to the, the right of the graph, you will see that if you have a low VO2 max, maximal metabolic capacity, often measured on a bicycle or a treadmill, you will have a very high risk of dying compared to somebody who, on the left side of the graph, has a VO2 max of greater than 37 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So this 37 milliliters per kilogram per minute is still pretty low, so we're not talking about having to be an elite athlete. We're just saying if you have very low exercise capacity, you're more likely 
to die than if you have a higher uh, metabolic capacity. So I'm not naive enough to think that, that, that it's all about exercise and that there's not a lot of other things involved. There's a lot of choices in life. So you could you can go, you can exercise all the time and you can go to the fountain of youth, but occasionally, or maybe more often than you should, you might go to the fountain of bacon. So it turns out that there is that there is, it's not simply a, a matter of exercise, it's a matter of nutrition, it's a matter of genetics and everything else. I put this in just to remind us that there are choices that we have to make, and um, it's, it's not a very simple uh, scenario between being inactive or being active, but there are lots of other things that need to be uh, decided upon. So let's look a little bit at vascular health and see what we know. So you can't talk about vascular health, or at least in my opinion, you can't talk about vascular health without talking about the 1992 molecule of the year, which a very nerdy thing to even know exists. But uh, nitric oxide was the molecule of the year in 1992. It's still going well. I think, I'm not sure it actually made it the molecule of the decade. But nitric oxide, you can think of it as a very potent vasodilator. So basically, it causes blood vessels to go from being relatively narrow to being more dilated, opening up and letting blood go to an area that needs blood. But also, as you can see in that other figure, it has a lot of other components. It plays a lot of other roles in terms of decreasing atherosclerosis and keeping blood vessels healthy. So it's not just related to dilation and opening up blood flow, but it's also keeping those blood vessels healthy. And it turns out that John Brady, when he talks, I'm not sure if he's going to mention this, but there is clearly a strong link between nitric oxide, which is anti-atherogenic in the cardiovascular system, and also its role in the cerebral circulation. So having less NO around, it may or may not be a problem with, with blood flow in the brain, but having less healthy vessels, you're more likely to develop things like Alzheimer's. So nitric oxide is very important. We're thinking more in the periphery at the moment, so I'm going to show you a couple of, or at least a few studies that, that uh, deal with that. Essentially, nitric oxide is stimulated, the production of nitric oxide is stimulated by shear stress, the black arrow, with blood running through the vessel lumen, you can see at the top of the slide. And as a consequence of a series of cascading events, nitric oxide is produced by the endothelial cells, released to the smooth muscle cells, and then they cause a vasodilation, opening up of the blood vessels. So one thing that we found many years ago now is that one way to test somebody's nitric oxide bioavailability, and it sounds somewhat crazy, but if you just have somebody lay down and then passively move their leg, by doing that, you actually cause some uh, mechanical deformation inside the muscle bed. And inside that muscle bed, the vessels are there. The vessels are being moved and torqued. And as a consequence of that moving and torquing, we, we end up with, an, an, we think, an NO-mediated vasodilation. That if you look, this is a baseline blood flow. You can see the beginning of the dots there, a little bit of a teaser for what the data are going to look like. So blood flow on the uh, y-axis and time on the x. When you move somebody's leg, they didn't do anything at all. This is in liters, this is in milliliters. They didn't do anything at all, but you just move that leg. Well, by moving that leg, you get a big increase in blood flow in a healthy young person. And that's because we've stimulated, or we think we've stimulated nitric oxide bioavailability, increased nitric oxide bioavailability. So this is a test I'm going to show you a few uh, present or a few uh, sort of nuggets related to aging using this model. So here's an example of uh, us doing the test. In this case, we're looking at both left and right femoral blood flows at the consequence of moving one leg. Um, as I look at this slide, it's interesting. I keep seeing Jason over here thinking that it's nice that he's an assistant professor here at BYU. And these guys are both, this is me, many, several years ago now. Uh, the other two guys, postdocs in the lab, are both assistant professors in different places, one at Kent State and one at Skidmore College. Um, 
So if you do passive leg movement in young and old people, you can see that there's quite a difference between the responses. So in the young at the top, you have a significant large rise. This is average, these are average data. And in the in the old, you have a lower value in the in the older subjects when you do this passive leg movement response. Now I said I think it's nitric oxide mediated, but we have to prove that to you. So the way to prove that is we, and I just added to this top graph, I added the same study, but this time we infused a nitric, uh, an endothelial nitric oxide synthase block. So we put an arterial line in the femoral artery, and we infuse into the leg something that's going to stop nitric oxide from being released, and then we do the movement with the leg. And you can see that it turns out that there's about an 80% drop in the response in the young people because when you move the leg, nitric oxide, which is anti-atherogenic, very helpful, very good uh, molecule to have around, it's being blocked and you can see that there is less of a response. Now when we do the same thing in the old, you actually see now, if you look at the right side, you can look at both, both of those graphs now with or without endothelial nitric oxide synthase blockade, so we're no longer producing nitric oxide, or very little, you can see that in the old there's much less of an attenuation. Suggested with the fact that as you get older, nitric oxide is less bioavailable, and one of the explanations for why when you measure this passive leg movement response, PLM response, one of the reasons is because there's less nitric oxide around, and that is not good in terms of cardiovascular health. So what about exercise in this passive leg movement? Because we know, no matter, I, sh I showed you the fountain of bacon, the fountain of uh, youth. As you get older, there are so many more complications in life and things you tend to do less, like when you have, as you get, if you have kids and then you have a job and all the things that become, make you less and less active. So we need to think about exercise. And if you look at this, interestingly, this is a young, an example of a young, healthy person's passive leg movement response. And obviously, it looks impressive. This is the response from a couch potato. And if you think back to the slide I showed a second ago, that looks a lot like young and old. So you have a big dilation, a lot of blood going to the leg, and it's moved in a young, healthy, physically active person. And when you look at somebody who's more like a couch potato, have a much diminished response. So we think that that is part of the, the effect that we're seeing as a consequence of aging, it's not just to do with aging. You can see then it's quantified between the young, healthy person, tall, large bar, and the small bar from the um, sedentary young person. So what we did in this study is we wanted to see what was the role of physical activity in this passive leg movement Across, uh, across older people. So, and we include some young people as control. So in the black bars are the young people, and white, uh, old sedentary, gray, old active, and uh, kind of sage, uh, old trained. Now interestingly, it's not that easy to find old trained subjects in various places, like for instance, the United States. Now, I used to say, that we could maybe find them in England, but England has gone downhill in terms of physical activity and diet as well. And I'm from England, that's why I like to mention that, that was, that's the case. Uh, I used to always plug the fact that English was, but I think we're catching up with the United States in terms of inactivity. So for this beige group, we actually had to go, because if you look at this, you can see that this, one of these, these bottom graphs are actually VO2 max. These, when I say old, all of our studies are 70 years and older. So at least an average age of 70, sometimes 80, 90, we have some centenarian studies. But in these people, they were 70 years old, and you can see the bottom two graphs, that VO2 max, which is maximal aerobic capacity, was actually greater than the younger people. And that's not easy to find. We actually had to go to Norway to find those people. So we went to Norway, we found a whole load of, well not a whole load, we found I think 14 cross-country skiers who were in their 60, well, 70, 65 to 85 year olds. Some of them going to the track, keeping themselves in really quite incredible shape. So we ended up with young, um, old sedentary, old active, and old trained. 
And when we did this passive leg movement, we had a, this is a little bit complicated because we sometimes do the passive leg movement in a supine position, sometimes we do it seat, seated upright. It turns out that we found from those LNMMA studies, those blocking studies for nitric oxide synthase, we found that going from supine to upright gives you a good indication of NO bioavailability without even doing the drug infusion. When you're supine, you have less of a role of NO than when you're sitting up there. And that's to do with the hydrostatic column and some other things. <clears throat> so when we compare the difference between supine and upright PLM, you get a very strong, very clear picture. In the young, there is a reasonably good PLM response. Pretty good, but they are relatively sedentary young people. If you had an active group on there, it would likely be higher. But look at the very low response that we got in old sedentary PLM response. It's actually somewhat negative. So old sedentary people who had their leg move was almost, almost no impact on blood. When you are active and older, you're working your way back up and looking reasonable, but not as good as the young, maybe less than half. But those, even those very well-trained Norwegian cross-country skiers ended up even after all the work they put in, they weren't quite yet getting back to the sedentary <coughs> controls who were young. But you can see that all of the effort they put in got them to probably just over half. So it's not completely wasted, but for this message, for that part, I would say it looks as if aging is playing a role that can be offset by exercise, but not completely restored. So because that's cross-sectional, we had to do a study where we trained older people. There's an old, with and without, L, an old group with and without LNMMA infusion, so nitric oxide block. And you can see little effect. Then after training, these were just relatively normal older people. Once we trained them, we did this passive leg movement again. And you can see now that dark filled circles, there is a much bigger response. And the role of nitric oxide has become larger. The role of nitric oxide is the difference between these two lines. The, the difference between those two lines is the impact of nitric oxide. So exercise training does improve nitric oxide in older people. And nitric oxide is anti-atherogenic. So that's a good thing, and it looks as if exercise, as we said, it can restore things, maybe not completely restore, but it's going the right direction. And then also, in terms of plasticity, we need to think not only about how things can improve, but how things get worse. One of the things that older people often experience is short or longer extended periods of bed rest because of injury or because of depression or things like that. And you can see here that what we did is we just had, we, we took a group of relatively active older people, 11,000 steps a day on average, and we made them just do 3,000 steps a day. So we had a pretty significant drop in their physical activity. And you can see the PLM response in the black is the initial, and the gray is after they come back. But the little, the beige in this case, is in the middle, is how the passive leg movement response, that hyperemic response, increased blood flow response to passive leg movement, was diminished very quickly, even after two weeks. So you can see that nitric oxide is definitely something that's important. But it's easy to gain, it's relatively easy to lose it. And it takes probably a lot of work to get to gain it. So, but, so we, can't, we can't just say, well, I've exercised for the last 10 years, I should be good. Because if you take two weeks off, you'll see your nitric oxide bioavailability drop. So in terms of muscle aging, something that we are interested in is, well, we're interested in muscle function because muscles are obviously very important for mobility. And mobility is what keeps us active and able to avoid falls, etc. So one of the ways to look at muscle aging is to look at telomeres or telomeres. I'm not quite remember now exactly which way I would say it and then you would say it here. Telomeres. Both? Okay, so I'll just go with telomeres. It's still easier. Um, so Telomeres are basically the ends of your DNA. They're, they're protective ends to the DNA, and they are protecting you from damage. So with such things as free radicals, your telomeres become shorter and shorter. And if you look at cell telomere length, 
you can say this cell is aging or this cell is not aging. You can get an indication of senescence of those cells, the aging process. So, telomere length is what we were interested in this, in this uh, study. And so we kind of came up with what we thought was an interesting model. We looked at young people, 25 year olds, and we got a group of old mobile and old immobile. And then, and this was Massimo Vincerelli, now he's an assistant professor at the University of Verona, was a postdoc in our group. Um, if you look at this, these three groups, you can see that you've got relatively active young people, older mobile people, probably less active in general, and then old immobile who are definitely less active. But in addition to that, we decided that we would biopsy both, because we wanted to look at muscles, so we biopsy the biceps and the quadriceps. So now we had a really even more interesting and much more difficult to write up project, because now we have legs that are being used in the young and the old mobile, but not being young, used in the old immobile. But the arms are probably fairly similar across all three groups. Because most people don't use their arms very much, except this chap's getting a good stretch here in his arms. I thought he was waving to me, but he's just doing something with his arms, because I mentioned arms, I think. So, if you hear somebody, an example of that, you really don't do much with your arms when you're 20, and you're not going to do much with your arms when you're 80. And you can tell that by looking at muscle mass. So, this is daily caloric expenditure on the x-axis. And as you, the young people are in the, uh, the solid circles, and the old immobile people are in the open circles, in the middle are the older people. And you can just see that you have more muscle mass the more active you are in your legs. This is, mus this is an activity, caloric expenditure measured for the whole body. So we just used like an accelerometer to measure how much activity the people were doing. And you can see that active people have larger muscle mass. And people who are in a wheelchair have less muscle mass. But only in the legs. Because in the arms, nobody has a difference in muscle mass unless you go and stand and lift weights. Most people just have the same muscle mass now until you're 80 in the arms. So remember that arm leg difference. So now if you look at telomere length with age, you can see on the left side that as you go from young to old mobile to old immobile in the legs, you are getting more and more evidence of aging muscle. Suggestive of the fact that there's something more than aging <coughs> because these two groups, the two older groups, are exactly the same age. These subjects were 90 years old. So these 90 year olds were exactly the same age, but in the old mobile and the old immobile, you can still see a difference in the telomere length, which is indicative of aging of those muscle cells. And so that suggests that there is something other than aging going on. What really nails that down is look at the arm data. The arm data says that with exactly the same age muscle, there is no difference in telomere length because the arms don't change their activity throughout life. So we think that the aging process associated with muscle and most, many, most tissue is probably affected by activity more than aging. And you can see that because we have this really cool control, a little bit better than we thought. Arms, no effect whatsoever of age. But in the legs, uh, yeah, and no effect of activity in the, in the arms either, but in the legs you can see that it's not just age, it's certainly activity. So there's a kind of summary of that data, is we just said, but if you look at the arms, this is telomere left on the y-axis, and you can follow the blue line, the arms don't change telomere length at all. But at some point, when you become inactive, as you start to become inactive, even if you're a mobile, inactive older person, telomere length, which is an indication of aging um, of muscle, in this case, starts to show evidence of, of aging. And then if you were actually less mobile because you'd be in a wheelchair, you would find that you have even greater level of 
uh, fall and tell me that. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a little bit of mechan a little mechanism here. And the mechanism, and I didn't mention it in the vascular side, but one of the fastest reactions in the body is nitric oxide and superoxide. Superoxide is a free radical. I didn't mention that, but in the aging vascular side of things that I talked about, you have to remember that nitric oxide is always being quenched by free radicals. So the chance of having less nitric oxide can be changed by having a lot of free radicals. One way of getting a lot of free radicals is, for instance, to be very inactive. Another way is to eat high fat foods so you can see the links. Well, here, this telomere data I just showed you, you can see that there is a very strong relationship between shortening telomeres and increasing free radicals, but only in the left. These were biopsies from the same people, but the two sets of tissue, same people, same age, but the same tissue only shows a relationship with oxidative stress or free radicals in the legs compared to the arms. And I would argue that's because physical activity changes your free radical status. And physical activity doesn't change in the arms, it only changes in the legs, especially in this model where we had some legs that were in wheelchairs, some legs that were from older people, and some legs from young people. Okay, final one. Limitations to exercise. So, five minutes. Okay, one up. Tough man. So, exercise capacity, VO2 max. We like to think of it as two components. The left side is utilization, the right side is oxygen transport. So, Jason's going to recognize these slides. Oh, he made a couple of them next year. So, we think of it as two components mitochondrial demand for oxygen and Oxygen transport, which is supply. So, any econo uh, economists in the room, it's like supply and demand. So, there's a certain demand for oxygen, a certain supply, but it doesn't always go the way you might think. Sometimes you can have supply be limiting, sometimes you can have demand be limiting. And just to tie this back to the vascular thing that I talked about before, the passive leg movement, it turns out that there is an interesting and strong relationship between. The passive leg movement response on the y-axis and your capacity to perform exercise on the x-axis. So your blood vessel response is definitely linked to your metabolic capacity, which makes sense because you have supply and demand. It would be it would make much sense to have you know a need for blood flow and not have some uh, ability to provide blood. Okay, so that's just to remind you that the blood vessels and the mit mitochondria and the muscle are linked. So we did an interesting study, in fact Jason did the study, so... Um, and this is what we did, is we looked at mitochondrial function, <coughs> as uh, illustrated by the pictorial mitochondria, and then we looked at in vivo, knee extensor maximal exercise, oxygen consumption, and then we looked at bicycle maximal exercise oxygen consumption. So we have in vitro in the mitochondria, we have in vivo in a small muscle mass, and we have in vitro in vivo in a large muscle mass. And I'm going to blur those two together. I'm just going to talk about in vitro and in vivo. So mitochondria and then in the body itself. So in order to measure mitochondrial function, we use respirometry. So we put mitochondria and we put muscle tissue in them in a respirometer, and then we provide it with everything it needs, and then we measure all its substrates that it needs, and we measure oxygen consumption. And we get those muscle samples from muscle biology. And interestingly, and these are, I think these are really interesting data regardless of aging, but these are data from young people during, um, or with a combination of measurements. The first, that gray bar, is the VO2 max in the mitochondria in vitro, so just on their own, the mitochondria, this is how much oxygen they consume. In vivo, calculating how much muscle mass somebody has, etc., we, we came up with this value to say, well, a little bit less than what they could consume in the bath. And O2 supply was slightly above both of those, so enough oxygen to provide mitochondria with oxygen, and enough oxygen supply to supply oxygen to those mitochondria in vivo. And exercise train 
A lot more mitochondria. Young people, lots more mitochondria, exercise adaptation obviously has occurred. And now, what happens when you look in vivo? Well, it seems to be a little bit more mitochondrial capacity than they really need in vivo. And then oxygen supply, it turns out oxygen supply for these young people was higher than the mitochondria need in vivo, which you always need. To, well, the best situation would be to have more supply than demand, probably in most cases. But in this case, it looks quite clear that the mitochondrial capacity in well-trained young people exceeds the need for in vivo mitochondrial oxygen consumption. But supply looks like it's, it's there and appropriate. So if you look at that as a percentage, so now it's a percentage of the, what percentage is the white bar of the gray bar? And in the untrained, they're using like 95% of their in vivo, uh, in vitro capacity, or yeah, 90% of their in vitro capacity, whereas the trained are only using about 75% of their in vitro mitochondrial capacity. So really cool data, I think, is this is the, the untrained group, and now we're looking on the x-axis of that mitochondrial VO2 max, what's measured in the bath, and what's measured in the body. And you can see that if you, and these are the same, these are individuals. So what I'm gonna say is a little bit of a stretch, but if you increase VO2 max, in the mitochondria for these people, the x-axis moved to the right, you will see a very clear increase in VO2 max in the body. So there's a strong relationship in well-trained, I'm sorry, untrained young people between mitochondrial availability of capacity, measured in the back, and what they produce in vivo. But now look at the untrained group. They don't care if you change the amount of mitochondria so if you have more or less mitochondria in a trained person, as long as, long as you've got a certain threshold of mitochondria, mitochondria don't become that important anymore. You remember the two components I said for limiting exercise? Demand and supply. These people in the, in the filled dots are clearly demand limited. They improve their exercise capacity if they have more mitochondria. Whereas the trained people, it doesn't matter if they've got, they know they've got a lot of mitochondria, we know they have a lot of mitochondria, but whether you have more or less above a threshold, it doesn't matter, they're more supply limited. So let's just look at this, so this is the same graph I just showed you for that young group. Now look at the old group, I don't need to explain it, it just looks the same. It looks about the same. The, the general shape of these bars and the general shape of these bars are about the same. So it suggests that older people have exactly the same sort of physiology as younger people. You can have demand limited and supply limited older people if they're trained. So you can so it looks like it's not just to do with aging, it's to do with physical activity. You can certainly you can certainly be in either group depending on a choice that you make. And then, that's, this is the ratio between those two. It's probably down a little bit. So this is the ratio of what you can use in the bath compared to what you could use in vivo. And it's coming down a little bit compared to the young. So they're not using full mitochondrial capacity, or maybe, not much different over here, probably. And then that graph I showed you before, and Jason sent me something last night, he's probably fuming mad now, but I couldn't get it to load. You know, I pulled the old, old mentor question and said, Jason, can you send me the rest of those data? And he sent it to me and he worked on it yesterday and I couldn't get it to load into the program. But essentially, you, the story isn't far off this, is that you still see the same pattern. In untrained older people, there's a stronger tendency to be dependent on mitochondrial capacity. Whereas when they're trained, they become less dependent on mitochondrial capacity, more O2 supply than that. Which suggests to me, I find that fascinating because it suggests that when you're older, you are responding just like a young person to training. You're shifting from being demand limited to being O2 supply limited. Why do you not bother about mitochondria beyond a certain threshold? Probably because of things like, let's get back to free radicals, having more mitochondria is useful. It might be useful in reducing or lowering the number of free radicals. 
But at some point, you just don't need any more mitochondria to perform the work because you're limited by oxygen supply. Heart might not be able to pump enough blood to the muscles to be able to work properly. So just to finish, we go back to uh, Johanna. And the quote from Edward was, it is not by the gray of the hair that one knows the age of the heart. And I added, rather, it is by the consistency with which the fountain of youth has been accessed. So my take on message is that what I've shown you, I think, is that there is very strong evidence that older people have very similar plasticity to younger people, very similar limitations to exercise to young people. And what people have, what older people have to do is to continue to be active to minimize the potential components that are associated with aging, osteoarthritis, other things get in the way. But generally speaking, activity can outweigh, in many ways, the changes associated with age. And this, just, just to say, all the people that are involved in this, this is our group. We have currently four faculty who are all in this picture, including me, and our postdocs and graduate students. And then uh, this, uh, and all the funding agencies that helped us over the years. And then, of course, everybody's probably seen this slide before, but I still like it. So if you can't figure out how to exercise for one hour, are you happy of being dead for 24 hours? So we need to squeeze it in, is my message.